Welcome everybody. Okay, so now let's dive into developing the natural numbers uh, one step at a time. So let's start with um, what is a number. So, so far we only have those guys from the previous videos, everything you can build with uh, the empty sets and the brackets. And we need to somewhat define uh, the natural numbers. Um, so we need to define essentially um, uh, what zero is, what one is, what two is, and we need to do it in a way that we can identify who they are in a nice way. Um, so if I ask uh, you what sh zero should be, you will say, well, zero should be the empty set, so that's kind of quite reasonable. I mean, we just have to pick elements and give them names, zero, one, two, three, and we want to do it in a way that is algebraically easy and combinatorially easy to work on. So, and then you say, what's, what's one? And Usually when I ask that question, people are ah, what about the set that contains the empty set? Sounds like an obvious choice. Um, cool, what about two? Well, now for two we have a few more options. Um, because you could, for instance, say the empty set, which contains the set, which contains the empty set, and then for three you could do the empty set of the empty set of the empty set of three. Um, and so on and so forth, you will get, essentially we have a bunch of different sets, they are all different, they, um, you can name them. Um, combinatorially, uh, this is not the best option, and it's not the more standard way, so we are not going to do this. Um, just because it's going to work better for our definitions. We're going to choose a different, a different path, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, 2 is the empty set that contains the empty set, and the set with the empty set, so the previous two. And then three is gonna be the previous three, the empty set, set with the empty set, and the previous one. Oh, sorry. So that's three, the previous three guys together. And that's the way we continue all the way. So we're just, Essentially, picking sets and giving them name, not name 0, 1, 2, 3, so then we can define all the natural numbers. So here is the more formal definition. So each number is going to be the set of all the previous ones. All right, so the number n is going to be the set 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. Yeah, where what's n minus 1? n minus 1 is the set 0, 1, to all the way to n minus 2. Um, okay, so each number is the set of all the previous ones. Uh, one advantage that has um, this way of doing it is that now uh, the size of the number n, like how many elements are there in the set representing n, is exactly n, right? So the number n has n elements inside, so that's also going to be quite useful for, for the combinatorics of this thing. Um, all right, so that's what we have here, no? So this, this guy three here that we did before is essentially the set zero, one, two, and two is the set zero, one. And this is the set zero. And empty set is the empty set because it's, the zero is empty because it's not, it has nothing below. Okay, so those are gonna be the numbers for us. Um, okay, so now we need, uh, the next step is to find a way to find a formula that defines, that tells you what's a number. Um, but the formula it has to be an, an inside formula from our first order logic. We cannot say, oh, a number is something that can be built this way in finitely many steps. We still don't even know what finite means in size set theory. We know it's from the outside, but we don't know it's from the inside, what, how you talk about finite things, uh, finitely many steps built. We need a, a property that these objects are have so that we can say everything that has this property is going to be a natural number. Um, so before that, let me take one step back, and this is going to be useful actually for the definition, uh, is how do you define the successor? Like given a number n, how do you define the successor, meaning n plus 1? And, and this is the property. Like um, we can define um, the successor of a when we do it, we define, we put the plus. We're going to use this quite a bit in the next couple of videos. 
So A plus is just a very simple definition. It's a set A union A itself. Let me, let me give you an example. So let's suppose that A is a set that contains, let's say, two elements, B and C. All right? So it's not a number, but it's still, we can still talk about the property uh, A plus. Uh, this property, this operation, A plus. That, you can find it on any set. And it's just A plus is going to be this set, B, C, namely A, union, the set that contains A. Set that contains the set B, C. Right, so what is that? So that is the set that contains B, C, comma, B, C. Okay, so that means you just put the full set inside. That's what you do when you do A+. plus. You keep all the elements and you put the full set inside. So if you have a number, so if you have uh, the number N, which is equal one, no, sorry. 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. When you do n plus, you're going to get the set that contains 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. So everything that's on n, and you put n inside. So let me just write, do it in two steps. By the definition, that's equal to this union, the whole set n. And then that's the same thing as 0, 1, all the way, n minus 1, n. Right? And that is exactly n plus 1. We don't have a plus 1 and minus 1 yet, but I'm just giving you the intuition. Right? So when you have a natural number, uh, the ways we define them so far, if you do this plus, you get essentially the next natural number. Cool. Okay. Um, so that's a concrete definition for plus. So every natural number can be built by iterating this plus, essentially. Starting from the empty set, you iterate. Um, finitely many steps, we don't know what that means, because I mean, we're trying to define natural numbers. To understand finite, you need to understand the natural numbers. But we are going to do it like indirectly. So this is what we do. So we say that a set is inductive. This is a new definition. It's a bit abstract is inductive if it contains zero and is closed under successor. Uh, by successor, I mean this plus operation, right? So that means, um, so a set S is inductive if zero belongs to S and for every A that belongs to S, A plus also belongs to S. So, for instance, the V omega that we had before is inductive because if you have a finite set and you do the successor, you still find it. So, uh, so that's inductive, even though it's not a set yet. For us, V omega is still not a set. But uh, if, it did, if it was, it would be inductive. So everything that is close under this operation is inductive. Um, there, there could be more things than the natural numbers. Uh, by one property, if you are inductive, Then what do we know? Then, well, zero has to belong to S because that's part of the definition. And then it's close under plus. So if zero belongs to S, then one has zero plus, which is equal to one, has to belong to S. But then if one belongs to S, uh, one plus, which is equal to two, has to belong to S. And so on and so forth, right? And then you're going to get that uh, 3 belongs to S, and 4 belongs to S, and so forth. So if you're inductive, you must contain all the natural numbers. So we can take that as a definition. Okay, so this definition, so far, the way I've done it, I mean, these guys up here, we can do one at a time. But V omega, we, don't, we cannot define V omega so far, um, because... Uh, with this infinite union, I guess you have to put them all in a set together. How do you put them in a set together? We don't have the actions to do that yet. So, so let's think of this construction as a construction outside from mathematics, from real mathematics. Looking for so n is a natural number if it belongs 
to all inductive sets. Okay, so that's the definition for a natural number. You belong to all inductive sets. Um, so being inductive is a, is a formula we can define very easily, close on the successor. There are inductive sets that have more stuff than the natural numbers, as we said, the omega, or everything, well, everything is not a set, but there are things that are being close on their successor. doesn't mean that you're exactly natural numbers. You can be more. But if you're a natural number, you must belong to all inductive sets. And we're going to take that as a definition. So it's a, a, a kind of an, a definition from the outside. Once we know what something is inductive here, being if you belong to all of these things, the only way is that you're a natural number. So that's going to be our definition for the natural numbers. And the next question is, okay, now we want the set of all the natural numbers. And um, well, if according to our definition, a natural number is something that belongs to all inductive sets. So the set of the natural numbers should be the intersection of all the inductive sets. Okay, so we want to take the intersection of all inductive sets. This is a big intersection because there are a lot of inductive sets. And how are we going to take the intersection of all such big elements? Well, you can say, I guess, once we have uh, one inductive set, just take all the sub-inductive sets. So we could say uh, fix an inductive set. And then say um, omega is the set of all and say, let's call it i. All the x's that belong to i, such that for every subset of i, of i that is inductive, then x belongs to b. So if you had one inductive set of oh, If you had one inductive set, then we can take all the elements inside that belong to all sub-inductive sets. And that will follow that definition. And then you could show it would require a little proof, just a small step, that this definition of omega does not depend on the inductive set you take. Because it's essential, this is essentially the intersection of all inductive sets. The intersection of two inductive sets, by the way, is inductive, because if both are closed and their successor, then the intersection is still closed on their successor. So this is essentially the intersection of all inductive sets. And we can define this by the subset axiom, right? This property, every inductive set B including I, B belongs to it. Um, and we don't even need to assume that it's a subset of I. For every B inductive, X belongs to B. So if X belongs to all inductive sets, in particular to this first one, we are, okay, so we are applying the the subset axiom, so we're taking this from one inductive set that we started from. Why is there any? Why is there any inductive set? So actually, as we mentioned in the previous video, so far, V omega, the one that it only contains finite things, or so finite things, or finite things, that's a model of all the axioms we have so far. All the elements there are finite, all the sets there are finite, and so there are no inductive sets in there. Um, so we need a new axiom. And the new axiom is going to say that there is an inductive set. That's it. Uh, inductive sets have to be infinite, because you have 0, you have plus 1, plus 1, plus, so they need to be infinite. Um, and once we have an inductive set, we can define omega the way we did. Because once we have an inductive set, we can take omega to be all the elements of it that belong to all other inductive sets, using the subset axiom. And that's exactly the set of natural numbers, right? So, by the way, let's write that down right here. Omega is a set of all the natural numbers. All the natural numbers. Which we usually call, in mathematics, n. But here we're going to call it omega. Okay. Um, so the axiom says there is an inductive set, and uh, we could the, the axiom could say there exists omega, there is a least inductive set, but we can deduce that from subset axioms, you don't even have to say that there is a least one. You just say there is one, and then you pick a, a least one. Um, so that's a way to say that there is something that is not finite. So that's, that's sometimes called the infinity axiom. And it's the axiom that allows us to move out of the finite world, but it tells us that 
something that is not finite exists. Okay, see you in the next video.